Good afternoon. I'm Spot on Weather, meteorologist Matthew Euler, and we're going to move into a very interesting topic today uh, with the training in the summer video weather training series. The next topic, we're going to break away from those mid-latitude upper level dynamics, which we, we've been covering the last couple videos, and we're going to move into an, a very appropriate topic this time of year as we're heading into the latter stages of July, we're going to move into the topic on tropical weather systems. A very interesting weather um, can obviously have major impacts on our United States coastlines, whether we're talking the Gulf of Mexico, the Florida Peninsula, on up through the East Coast. This definitely could be uh, a major impact to our uh, coastline. This image on the title slide shows an actual satellite image of the very, very dangerous Hurricane Katrina that came in um, basically uh, just to the east of New Orleans back in August of 2005, resulting in $125 billion in damage. This image showing you um, the general circulation, the, the general coil pattern uh, in the center, center of this particular image shows the eye where the air is actually sinking. Um, so uh, this, is, this was quite a storm obviously and uh, it was such a powerful storm. Katrina, that name was retired from the hurricane list and will never be used again. So let's get right into the training today. First we're going to start off with the definition of the tropics. And the definition of the tropics, if you were to look on a map, a world map, or if you were to look on a globe, <clears throat> the tropics are generally that area on the Earth's surface that extend between 23 and a half degrees north latitude at the Tropic of Cancer to 23 and a half degrees south latitude at the Tropic of Capricorn. And they are marked here on the map, 23 and a half degrees north. Zero represents the equator, zero degrees latitude, and then you see 23 and a half degrees south with the blue dash lines. So the tropics are generally defined as the areas between the red dash line, the Tropic of Cancer, and that blue dash line, the Tropic of Capricorn. And for a meteorological definition, we like to refer to the tropics as a region between the subtropical high pressure areas of northern and the southern hemisphere. Now typically the subtropical highs are going to be position around 30 degrees latitude in both the northern and southern hemispheres out over the ocean. Uh, so that's the meteorological definition. All right, so what's the general circulation like in the tropics? Uh, at the surface, we have northeast trade winds, which, which occur north of the equator, and those are represented by the red arrows. The red arrows represent the northeast trade winds. The blue arrows represent the southeast trade winds south of the equator in the southern hemisphere. So anytime you have airstreams meeting like this, where the northeast trades and the southeast trades meet or come together, that's known as convergence. And there's a definite name for that main line of convergence around the globe. Uh, it's, all, it's known as the intertropical convergence zone sometimes we refer to it as the near equatorial trade wind um, trough. So this is generally how thunderstorms get developing in the tropical areas when these two airstreams, these two trade winds meet. Now in the upper levels of the atmosphere over the tropics, we generally have a deep easterly wind flow between 15 degrees north and 15 degrees south usually some pretty deep easterly winds in between those latitude lines. These easterly winds are so deep, in fact, that they extend all the way up into the second layer of the atmosphere, which is known as a stratosphere. And these deep easterlies will migrate with the seasons, between the winter and summer seasons, respectively. And then we have shallow easterlies, which are poleward of that. If you look at the diagram on the right, you'll see shallow easterlies are marked between 15 degrees north and 30 degrees north or south latitude respectively. So 
With shallow easterlies, these are generally cover polar areas of the tropics, and the shallow easterlies can extend up to 25,000 feet. Now, as I already kind of alluded to, I mentioned something known as equatorial trough. This is a zone or a linear area of lower pressure in the tropics. <clears throat> when the northeast trade winds and the southeast trade winds converge, that causes rising air motion in the deep tropics, and that is the equatorial trough. Now, there's two configurations of this equatorial trough. <clears throat> there's the trade wind trough, which we already talked about. The trade wind trough is when these um, northeast trades and the southeast trades meet and there's uh, converging air, the air rises, creating a lot of thunderstorms. And that's the trade wind trough, also known as the ITCZ, Intertropical Convergence Zone, or NETWCZ, the Near Equatorial Trade Wind Convergence Zone. And again, this is the location where the trade winds meet, the northeast trade winds in the northern hemisphere meet the southeast trade winds from the southern hemisphere. And they're found over open oceans and near the equator. And this trade wind trough, or ITCZ, is going to migrate depending on the time of year that we're talking. So if we're in the summer season in the northern hemisphere, if we're in the summer season in the northern hemisphere, that ITCZ is going to migrate north with the sun. Uh, if we're in the summer season in the southern hemisphere, that trade wind trough or ITCZ is going to move south. Another type of trough we find in the tropics is what's known as the monsoonal trough. And this forms as a series of heat lows, uh, commonly found over land areas in the tropical portions of the globe in the summertime. And the monsoonal trough is responsible for most thunderstorms, thunderstorm activity over the land in the tropics. So we'll show examples of that here uh, of these troughs. The first thing I'm going to talk about is a trade wind trough. Okay. What it looks like on a weather satellite image is this. The bottom of, the, of this particular image, you see I have the oval shaped, the red outlined oval shaped area. What I'm looking for is... Uh, thunderstorm development um, and that's going to be denoted, denoted on this infrared satellite picture as very bright clouds. So you'll notice my red oval um, sh circular shape here shows and highlights you see the brighter white clouds and this is the location at which the northeast and the southeast trade winds are converging. So if I'm looking on a satellite image this is what I'm looking for. I'm looking for a discontinuous line um, generally you know depending on the time of year, uh, 5 to about 15 degrees north of latitude. Just to, that's where you're going to have that convergence really uh, present. Now we'll talk about another feature in the tropics, another pressure system, and it's called the subtropical ridge. And it's denoted by the blue H on, the, on this diagram to the right. You see the blue H? Um, generally situated as a near continuous belt of high pressure around Earth, generally situated at about 30 degrees latitude. It's a warm core type high, which means the warmest temperatures are towards its center. And it's found furthest or farthest poleward in the hemisphere summer, whatever hemisphere is experiencing summer. So the subtropical ridge or subtropical high is going to expand northward in the summer season for the northern hemisphere. And then it's going to move closer to the equator, sag south in the winter season in the northern hemisphere. Generally, there's good weather associated with this ridge. Um, one, one major note in the Atlantic is sometimes referred to as the Bermuda High because it's situated generally, the center of it situated in the vicinity of the uh, Bermuda Island. And the flow around this high pressure system is clockwise. So this is responsible for producing the very muggy weather, persistent southerly wind flow along the U.S. East Coast in the summertime. Another thing of importance to note is that these high pressure systems are responsible for steering tropical cyclones as they move from east to west. The easterly winds in the trade wind area, those, those easterly trade winds are pushing along tropical systems from the east toward the west in the tropics and these subtropical highs are responsible for steering these particular systems. 
So it's very important to look at the position, for example, of the Bermuda High in the North Atlantic Ocean. Um, see how that ridge is, where that's ridging, which way it's orientated, the ridge, as far as where the tropical systems are going to end up if there's landfall possibilities for the U.S. coastline. Another, another interesting feature of the tropics that we need to take a look at is known as monsoons. Now, monsoons are seasonal reversal of prevailing wind flow. And the monsoon is derived from the Arabic word mossum, meaning season, and was originally used to describe the winds of the Arabian Sea, which blow for about six months from the southwest, and they blow six months from the northeast. And I'll show you what's behind monsoons and the development of monsoons, but just keep this in mind. Monsoons literally mean seasonal reversal of winds. The driving mechanism of a monsoon is the differential heating between the Asiatic continent, the landmass, and the nearby water in the Indian Ocean. And that's gonna vary seasonally between summer and winter time. With the Northeast monsoon, the formation occurs with high pressure over Siberia, over the colder Siberian continent during the winter time. The air masses are very cold, usually have a snowpack, which helps to make that, that overlying air even colder. So you get these strong high pressure systems that are situated over Siberia during the Northeast monsoon. And the flow around those high pressure systems in the Northern Hemisphere is clockwise. So high pressure is going to ridge itself or extend itself down to, to the Tibetan Plateau. And this is gonna create a cold, dry, anticyclonic winds, that anticyclonic flow around the high pressure that's over Siberia. And that's, that flow is going to result in a predominant northeast winds um, over the Indian Ocean and South China Sea during the winter time in the Northern Hemisphere. The winds literally blow from the land to the sea because the air is so cold and dense over the, over the land mass that it tends to blow towards the water around these high pressure systems. It's also known as a winter monsoon and for the Northeast monsoon, it's the dry season for Southeast Asia, locations such as India. India gets a majority of their annual precipitation during the Southwest monsoon, during the summer season. Um, but the winter season, it's a very dry area. So what we have going on synoptically, this is um, the mean wind flow for the month of January at the surface. This uh, blue H indicates the location of that high pressure system over the Asiatic continent. Um, the arrows indicate the direction of wind flow. Uh, generally, we have high pressure over the land. Uh, we have wind flowing clockwise around the high pressure system in the Northern Hemisphere. And that's resulting in a predominantly northeasterly wind flow and dry conditions. The Southwest monsoon, on the other hand, uh, the formation of a heat or thermal low pressure forms over the Tibetan Plateau in summertime because now the land mass is heating up much quicker than the nearby surrounding water. So you have air rising over that very hot land mass and you have wind blowing from the water from the Indian Ocean. It's blowing towards the Asian continent to replace the air that's rising over that land, the heated land. This creates a cyclonic wind flow over Southeast Asia and it's going to bring in a lot of warm and moist air from the Indian Ocean and South China Sea. So the Southwest Monsoon is also known as the Summer Monsoon, and it's the wet season for Southeast Asia. So if you ever had a trip over to India um, during the summer months, uh, July, August time frame, for example, uh, you might want to pack an umbrella if you're going to India, for example, because it's, it's the wet season. It's the Southwest Monsoon season there. They're going to get more of a predominant southwesterly wind flow in this case, and air is going to rise over the landmass and blow in from the Indian Ocean, from the water toward the land, and that's going to result in a lot of thunderstorms and heavy rain. Um, some of the wettest locations, such as Cherpunji, India, they get very, very heavy rain amounts during the southwest monsoon season with the predominant southwesterly winds. And to make things more complicated, India has you know, larger mountainous areas too, so as that warm, moist wind blows up against the windward side of these mountain ranges, it's going to result in a lot of heavy rainfall, and it could result in some um, 
flooding as well. So synoptically for the southwest monsoon, these are my average surface winds for the month of July. And you'll notice now my wind pattern has reversed. I have a seasonal reversal of the winds here during the summer months in the northern hemisphere where my land is heating up much, much more greatly than compared to the nearby water. And I have this flow of air from the ocean, the Indian Ocean, towards the um, landmass, lower pressure situated over northern India, directing that flow of warm, moist, southwesterly winds into the continent and a lot of rising air motion. All right, now we're going to move into the discussion on tropical cyclones. And this image, this satellite image, is a very nice image. It's taken just before landfall. This is when Andrew, Hurricane Andrew, in August of 1992, was positioned to the east of South Florida. Now, ultimately, with Andrew, it was uh, one of the very few Category 5 hurricanes that we've experienced in the United States making landfall. And ultimately, it made landfall around Andrew's Air Force Base uh, around Miami, Florida in late August of 1992. And then the, uh, the real other thing interesting about Andrew is it went across the southern Florida peninsula, southern part of the Florida peninsula, went back into the Gulf of Mexico, and then made a second landfall in Louisiana. Uh, so we can clearly see in this satellite image the eye where the air is sinking, a very distinctive feature of a tropical cyclone for sure. Right, so tropical cyclone in general, what is it? It's when we have low pressure, a low pressure center that forms over the warm waters of the tropics. It's a warm core low or cyclone. And whenever I say warm core low, the warmest temperatures are towards the center of the system. The uh, tropical cyclone season in the Northern Hemisphere, especially for the North Atlantic, that runs from one June and it's actually the last day of the season is 30 November. All right, so from 1 June to 30 November is tropical cyclone season in the Northern Hemisphere. The most active time period for the hurricane season in the Atlantic occurs during the late summer months, with the peak occurring around September 11th. 78% of all cyclones form in the Northern Hemisphere. So we have a lot of activity typically in the Northern Hemisphere now. I'm not just talking Atlantic side, I'm also talking the Eastern Pacific side, which has quite a few tropical cyclones each year. Um, and also we have to go out to the Western Pacific where you have a storm that's known as a typhoon. The only difference between a hurricane and a typhoon is the geography. With a hurricane, uh, a tropical cyclone forming east, east of the 180 degree west longitude line is known as a hurricane. Anything that forms west of the 180 degree west longitude line is known as a typhoon. Ty and foon literally meaning great wind. Um, this is an example on the image on the right here showing Hurricane Elena over the Gulf of Mexico. This was quite a powerful system in its own right. Right, so what do we need for tropical cyclone formation? What, what are the ingredients that we look for uh, to see if something is going to develop? or the professionals that work at the National Hurricane Center, what are they looking for, All right? First thing, you may have heard this on TV, you may have been watching the Weather Channel, you'll hear them always talk about vertical wind shear. With a tropical cyclone, we prefer to have weak vertical wind shear. That is a case where we have deep easterly winds. And when I say deep, you want winds to be from the same wind direction over a great vertical distance in the atmosphere. Also, we look for wind speeds at less than 20 knots. So we do not want a lot of changes in wind speed as we go up in the atmosphere either. We want the same wind direction and we want very light winds less than 20 knots because what that's gonna do, if you have stronger winds, that's going to rip apart thunderstorm tops and that's not going to allow those thunderstorms to get very organized. Another formation factor we need to look at are large ocean areas. A hurricane is a tropical cyclone that forms over warm ocean waters. And those warm ocean waters typically are 26 degrees Celsius, 79 to 80 degrees or greater. And we want a deeper layer of that warm water of 79 degrees Fahrenheit to at least 200 feet in depth into the ocean, the upper levels of the ocean. Um, so we want, basically a hurricane is going to derive its energy from that warm, moist ocean surface. As soon as a hurricane loses that warm, moist ocean surface, 
It loses its source of energy. For example, if it goes over land, you'll notice that a hurricane will dissipate or, or weaken fairly rapidly. The other interesting thing about ocean surfaces I wanted to mention is there's, there's some cases where you get two hurricanes that form really close to each other. Um, the first hurricane moves through over an, an ocean area, stirs up the top layers of the ocean, and actually brings cooler water from below the ocean surface to the top. And what this can do in this case, the second site, if you have one that's nearby, another tropical cyclone, another hurricane, that can actually move over cooler waters because the first hurricane has brought those cooler waters up from the, from the deeper layers of the ocean. And that can actually weaken the second storm. Um, so it's real interesting. You gotta keep in mind what generally that the ocean areas, the very warm water is the ultimate source of energy for hurricanes and tropical systems. Third, we want to we, we prefer to have a pre-existing low-level convergence area and you can get that pre-existing low-level convergence via what we already talked about earlier and that would be these troughs, right? Trade wind trough or ITCZ, the intertropical convergence zone where the trade winds meet. You've got two uh, primary air currents meeting um, just north of the equator. That's a great area for um, the pre-existing low-level disturbances to keep going. Additionally, in those monsoonal troughs over land, sometimes you can get that development uh, just offshore of that as well. And then we want the other big factor for tropical cyclone formation is something known as the Coriolis parameter. Coriolis is an apparent force in the northern hemisphere, which basically results in a deflection of objects, including the wind above the surface. Everything is going to deflect to the right of its attendant path of motion in the northern hemisphere. That's a Coriolis force. Um, simply put, there is zero Coriolis. That, that twisting pattern that you need to get things to kind of get spinning up in the atmosphere, there's a zero Coriolis at the equator. So you need to be between, we need a pre-existing low-level disturbance between 5 degrees and 20 degrees in latitude, in addition to the weak vertical wind shear, large ocean areas. All right, so here's an example of some of the factors we just talked about. If we have light upper level winds, that's a great thing for hurricanes to develop because as these thunderstorms form, they basically continue to rise unimpeded. The winds are so light that they're not going to, if we have stronger winds again, they're going to rip apart those thunderstorm tops and will not allow these thunderstorms to continue to blossom and develop. We have a lot of heat and a lot of moisture from that warm ocean surface warmer than 80 degrees Fahrenheit in this particular diagram. The, um, you can see the, the white areas here represent the formation of thunderstorms and these thunderstorm tops get very, very tall. They go to very tall heights. If we got a pre-existing low level disturbance, that's even better um, because then we're going to have some kind of cyclonic turning which starts things off, really gets things spinning around a general low pressure center. So Coriolis force is definitely a factor. And then you notice the blue arrows in this, in this particular uh, image graphic, um, those indicate high pressure, high pressure aloft. Hurricanes need a ventilation system. So when you have high pressure and light winds aloft over the top of these systems, that's going to remove mass out much quicker and allow a lot more vigorous rising air motion and most likely a strengthening tropical system. So what are the factors for tropical cyclones uh, for dissipation? All right, well, I kind of already alluded to this about tropical systems. Once they lose that source of energy via that warm ocean surface, once they move over land, uh, they can dissipate rather quickly. If these systems move over colder water. Um, so if you've ever noticed in the Atlantic Ocean, we may have a category five hurricane. It's happened in the last couple of years, actually. It happened with Hurricane Irma. It happened with Hurricane Florence last September, September 2018. These were monstrous storms, just monstrous storms at lower latitudes where the water temperatures were much warmer. Um, you know, we're talking about 85 to 86 to 87 degree water. And as these systems moved closer to the U.S. East Coast, started moving more northwesterly, they started encountering cooler and cooler water and that resulted in a gradual weakening of the storm as it made landfall. Um, Florence last year, you know, everybody was really worried about that one because it was a category five 
down in the Caribbean. But as it moved up towards the Carolinas, ultimately coming in South Carolina on landfall, it weakened down, I believe, to a Cat 1, but I'd have to look, uh, look again, but I think it was a strong Category 1 by the time it got up to uh, the South Carolina coast. Uh, this is another, when, when storms, these hurricanes move over colder water, this is also very important as far as the west coast goes. Uh, you'll see hurricanes forming in the eastern Pacific that will look very, very strong. They're very intense. Uh, could get up to Category 4 strength, but as they move northwest, they move into colder water associated with the California current, and that protects the Southern California area from getting a hurricane. Southern California really won't get a hurricane because the waters that are needed, the temperatures are much colder. And again, we need 79 to 80 degree Fahrenheit water for the hurricane to survive. By the time you get up towards Southern California, your water temperatures are 70 to 72. Additionally, if you increase the upper level wind shear, you're getting stronger wind speeds with height, or you're getting changing, changes in wind direction with height, it's going to rip apart the thunderstorm tops, not really allow the system to get better organized. And then upper level wind shear can also cause low level convergence to be greater than the upper level divergence. There's just no ventilation mechanism in place. You want high pressure over the top of these systems so it can readily ventilate all the mass aloft so you can get some very strong, vigorous updrafts and more thunderstorm development. And definitely if a hurricane makes a left turn in the northern hemisphere towards the equator and moves south, that's going to decrease your Coriolis force, that twisting motion you need to get that thing spinning, the system spinning. So if it moves towards the equator, which is very rare, but if it were to move towards the equator in the northern hemisphere, you're going to lose Coriolis force, which is going to result in a dissipation effect. So what are the stages of development for tropical systems? We're going to move into that next. All right, so with a tropical disturbance, it's just simply an organized mass of thunderstorms. All right, there is a slight wind circulation with a tropical disturbance. However, there are no closed isobars. Now, isobars, again, are lines of equal barometric pressure. And with a tropical disturbance, the surface winds are less than 33 knots. So we just have a... You know, you might just have a mass of thunderstorms in the tropics. It's something to keep an eye on for future development. Um, but if we do not have any um, closed isobars indicating a closed off system where the surface winds are less than 33 knots, this is something the National Hurricane Center will keep a close eye on. For, you know, they'll be looking at the wind shear out ahead of it. They'll be looking at the water temperatures. Um, they'll be looking at, you know, whether there's troughs that are going to result in increased wind shear. They're, they're going to keep an eye on this, but it's not organized enough and does not meet the criteria yet to be called a tropical depression or a storm. A depression, a tropical depression, if that disturbance continues to develop, the conditions are favorable, we get a definite cyclonic circulation or rotation, we have at least one closed isobar with a depression. So we've got a closed center, closed low level circulation center, the surface winds still remain 33 knots or less, but it's better organized with that one closed isobar. The storm is assigned a number. So for example, you may have seen this on TV where the meteorologist comes on and says TD3 or TD4, or TD number five, whatever the case. Um, the image on the right, bottom right, shows that area of low pressure, the L, with the arrows starting to really come in towards the center of it and converge resulting in rising air motion in these thunderstorms. If that depression further develops, it gets a name. And the name is uh, assigned to the system when as soon as it hits tropical storm status. With a tropical storm, the surface winds are 34 to 63 knots. The storm, again, is given that name. And cyclonic circulation occurs so now instead of just one closed isobar or line of equal pressure, we now have several closed isobars. So you'll notice on the bottom right, the black lines represent isobars, lines of equal surface pressure. And you notice how much, how we only had one isobar, 1,008 millibar isobar for the depression. And now we're having multiple isobars encircling around the center of this low pressure system, this tropical storm. With a hurricane or typhoon, the longitude, and I mentioned this earlier, but I'll mention it again, 
The longitude determines whether it is a hurricane or a typhoon. It's the same exact system, just a different name. With a hurricane or typhoon, the surface winds are sustained at 64 knots or greater. If I were to use miles per hour, it would be 74 miles per hour. That's the minimum wind you need to actually be, have a storm classify as a hurricane or typhoon. It keeps the same name as a tropical storm. With a hurricane or typhoon, you're going to get an eye or a cloud-free center. The diameter of the eye can be 5 to 20 miles wide. Um, now, one thing I want to mention about the eye, real interesting, is the smaller the eye, the smaller the diameter of the eye, the more intense the hurricane or typhoon. The bigger or wider the eye, the weaker, the less intense the hurricane or typhoon. You generally have relatively calm winds in the eye, and with the calm winds, well before the satellite era, some folks would go outside after one side of the storm passed through thinking the storm was over. But they were basically beneath the eye where the things got really calm for just a little bit. But as soon as the hurricane, the eye passed over, they had to experience the brunt of the other side of the hurricane. The other thing to mention about the eye that I wanted to really briefly mention is hurricanes and typhoons go through what's known as eye well replacement cycles. And eye well replacement cycles are, these occur when the outer eye wall, it's basically a hurricane or typhoon, forms a secondary outer eye wall. And as that secondary or outer eye wall contracts or gets closer to the center of the eye, it overtakes the primary eye wall right there near the eye itself. And in the process, there's a temporary weakening followed by an intensification once the eye wall replacement cycle is complete. So if you take a look and just Google it, it's a real interesting topic, eye wall replacement cycle. Uh, it really plays into the intensity of hurricanes or typhoons, especially, you know, is a system going through an eye wall replacement cycle as it hits land, as it makes landfall? That's the key thing to really look at when you look at the inner dynamics of a hurricane. Because if the eye wall replacement cycle has been completed just prior to landfall, that hurricane or typhoon may be much stronger. All right. There's something that we call when, when the hurricane or typhoon reaches a maximum wind speed equal to or in excess of 130 knots, we call this a super hurricane or super typhoon. So here is the general via the Comet program, this image courtesy of the Comet program, this is a general circulation pattern uh, within a hurricane or typhoon. Um, towards the outer portion of the hurricane, you get what's known as rain bands. And in these rain bands, if, you're, if you start feeling the effects of rain bands, uh, you'll get really a squally weather. And what I mean by squally is you'll get real heavy bursts of rain. The clouds will be moving really quick. And you get these heavy bursts of rain and these gusty winds but the rain won't last very long. The gustiest winds are usually associated with the heavier rain as the stronger winds from aloft get dragged down towards the surface. So in a rain band, you're getting hit with stronger gusty winds, brief gusty winds, and brief heavy rain. But as the hurricane approaches your area, you're going to be getting closer to a more intense portion of the hurricane known as the eye wall. And in the eye wall, the strongest winds exist as well as the heaviest rain. And if you're on the northeast quadrant of the hurricane, this is the area where you have to be very careful. You, you, you could get tornadoes with, with hurricanes, believe it or not. Um, generally, these, these orange, this orange arrow represents kind of like the, scor the corkscrew rising air motion in the eye wall. And then you have sinking air with high pressure over the top of the hurricane. You have a sinking air right through the center of the eye. And that's why the eye is cloud free because as air sinks, it dries out and dissipates clouds. So you have this feature in the center of the, uh, the storm known as the eye, where it's fairly clear, and you have sinking air motion. The blue arrow represents high pressure over the top of this system, and that high pressure, the anticyclonic or clockwise high over the top of it, is actually associated with lighter winds, and it's, it's actually removing mass out fairly quickly. It's like an efficient heat engine here. 
where the mass is being removed, upper level divergence is occurring much quicker than the low level convergence. Um, but in general, this is what you're looking at. I well, the most intense weather, that's where you're gonna get your strongest winds as well as your heaviest terrain. Here's a three-dimensional image, it's kind of cool. I just wanna show it from the GFDL um, from NOAA. This was Hurricane Andrew. If we were to look at it in the vertical, uh, the general structure of what the clouds would look like, and these cloud tops would be very, very high in the atmosphere. Um, and you see a lot of upward vertical motion. The arrows on the surface of the ocean show that counterclockwise rotation in the northern hemisphere around low pressure systems. And hurricanes happen to be one of the most intense storms on Earth. To the left, you see the, it's kind of like a skewed image of the Florida Peninsula as Andrew was heading west. This is Hurricane Opal. Opal hit the Florida Panhandle in 1995. Uh, actually, the Panhandle's been hit with quite, quite some uh, strong storms in the past. Uh, in 1995, they got hit by Hurricane Opal as well as Hurricane Aaron. But this is Opal, and this is early October 1995, three-dimensional view of, of the cloud structure and, again, the circulation around Opal. And uh, generally, you have high pressure with the red arrows aloft, lighter winds, and Opal was quite a strong system. Um, very similar to Hurricane Michael, which came into Florida, Panhandle, around Panama City last October. So these Gulf of Mexico systems can still be very intense in early fall. You know, when you think of fall, you're thinking of cooler weather, but when you live along the Gulf Coast, you definitely got to keep your eye to the sky in early, uh, early fall, especially late September, early October, because you can get some very strong tropical systems that come in. Here's another great image courtesy of NOAA. This is a satellite image showing uh, the features of a hurricane or a typhoon. Um, you have the eye wall, which is the very tall thunderstorm, thunderstorm surrounding the eye itself with the strongest winds and the heaviest rain. Uh, in this image, you can see the eye, which is the clear area at the center of the storm. Uh, if you were to look all the way down through the eye, um, you would see the ocean surface. So it's pretty cool. So there's eye wall and the eye in this particular uh, image that I'm showing you. And then there's outer rain bands, which extend they can extend 200 miles plus away from the center. Some storms are bigger than others. Some storms are more compact. But keep in mind again that the diameter of the eye, the diameter of the eye is so critical in determining whether we have a very intense system or a weaker system. This image, by the way, was Hurricane Fran back in 1996. And this was a scary system. I, I remember watching this one as it was uh, in the Caribbean and then it worked its way just east of Florida this one and Hurricane Floyd were very massive sized storms. This was Hurricane Lenny. Hurricane Lenny, this is a uh, enhanced IR image, colorized IR from GOES 8 satellite. And this was in November of 1999. This was down in the Caribbean. Um, the eye is indicated by that clear area and it's just the southeast of Puerto Rico uh, at this time. So this is November 17th. So this is, this is just right before Thanksgiving, and you're thinking, oh, I'm getting ready for the winter season. Again, hurricane season runs all the way out to November 30th, and so you can never let your guard down if you live along coastal communities. Hurricane Elena, once again, in the Gulf of Mexico. This was a massive size storm. What I'm really getting at here is just take a look at the size, how far out this system expands in the Gulf of Mexico. It covers over half of the Gulf of Mexico in this image. So these systems, you know, you don't, you don't have to be super close. The eye and the eye wall don't have to be super close for you to feel the impacts of hurricanes. This is a typhoon image west of 180 degrees west longitude. Now remember, typhoons are west of 180 degrees west longitude. Hurricanes are to the east of that longitude line. This is Super Typhoon Babs uh, via the NOAA 14 four kilometer uh, visible satellite. This is channel one of that visible satellite back on October 20th of 1998. And super typhoons are special, special storms because the winds are 130 knots or greater in such cases. So this is something that formed out in the western North Pacific, something you definitely don't want to be in the path of because places such as Guam, uh, the Philippines, um, even down to southeast China, and even these type of super typhoons can recurve and head up towards Japan. Very dangerous storms you want to completely stay out of their way.
All right, so after showing a couple images there, um, we're going to move into some of the damage instruction with hurricanes. Um, one of the biggest killers responsible for most deaths with hurricanes is what's known as a storm surge. Uh, basically, a storm surge is a push of ocean water into a coastal location on top of the flooding rains. So what you get is just catastrophic flooding. Um, the sea level, the ocean water just comes in. The sea level temporarily rises due to that very intense barometric pressure, the low pressure, and this huge wall of water comes spilling into the coastal areas. Uh, storm surge, very important if you live in a coastal location to know your zone, your evacuation zones, because there's different zones based on how close you live, for example, to the ocean. Um, if you live closer to the ocean, you're going to need to evacuate much sooner than somebody who lives further inland because of the storm surge threat. And what you want to look for when storm surge is a factor, what you'll hear a lot of is the tidal cycle. Storm surge on type of high tides is going to be much greater damage potential than storm surge with, at low tides. Um, that kind of goes in with the phases of the moon. You know, if you have a full moon or a new moon, the, um, the tidal pull, the gravitational pull by the moon is much greater, resulting in higher tides. So the phases of the moon come into play as a hurricane or typhoon approaches a coastline. Uh, torrential rains and flooding, obviously that causes a lot of damage inland, and it does not take a very strong tropical system. You don't need a hurricane to get catastrophic flooding. It could be a tropical storm. It could be a tropical depression. If the upper level winds are very weak and they're not moving the storm along very quickly, these type of systems can sit over coastal locations for days on end and just dump terren just torrential rains. This happened in her with her uh, with Harvey back in southeast Texas. Um, you know, just recently with uh, Barry. Barry came into Louisiana as a cat weak category one storm, and it looked like the flooding was going to be a lot worse than what it was. Thankfully, it wasn't as bad as what was predicted. But I will tell you this: uh, Tennessee got some of the worst rain that far inland from the Gulf of Mexico. Tennessee got hit with some record-breaking rain from the remnants of Barry. So again. Flooding, a definite threat. And then tornadoes. And, and with, with tornadoes, they generally occur on the northeast quadrant of a hurricane um, where you have the fastest blowing wind speeds of the hurricane on the east side of the storm. Those faster moving winds uh, encounter land and that land results uh, in a lot of friction. So it results in a lot of shear, a lot of directional shear, a lot of speed shear as a hurricane moves inland. So on that northeast quadrant, you really can get hit with fast-moving tornadoes, which are very dangerous because they're usually hidden within these tropical rain bands. So they're very hard to see. All right, that wraps the training up on the Tropical Weather um, Summer Video Weather Training Series. Uh, very appropriate for the time of year that we're in here in the third week of July. And just realize that the peaks of hurricane season, the, the most storms have formed um, in August and September, with the peak being around September 10th. Um, generally, what we covered today was the definition of the tropics. Uh, generally, 23.5 degrees north, Tropic of Cancer, to 23.5 degrees south, Latitude, Tropic of Capricorn. We talked about two different types of equatorial troughs. A trough is an area of lower pressure, and um, you get one of our major focuses in this training was on the trade wind trough, also known as the intertropical convergence zone, where the trade winds meet or converge from both hemispheres. Uh, there's also monsoonal troughs, especially over Southeast Asia that develop. And this is uh, generally low pressure systems and heavy thunderstorms that form over land with the monsoonal trough. Subtropical ridge, we talked about that feature that generally forms over the, over the ocean, over the ocean waters at 30 degrees north and south latitude. Subtropical ridges being very important as far as um, steering mechanisms for hurricanes as they move around the southern periphery of these ridges. Monsoons. Monsoon means seasonal reversal of wind. Uh, we have two types, in, especially over towards Southeast Asia. We have the Northeast Monsoon, which occurs six months of the year, where the wind blows predominantly from land toward water from the Northeast wind direction. And then we have a Summer Southwest Monsoon, which occurs during the uh, summertime in the Northern Hemisphere, where we have 
winds flowing from the southwest bringing a lot of warm and moist air and a lot of rainfall, especially to places like India. We talked about tropical cyclones, uh, the formation of tropical cyclones, what are the favorable factors to develop tropical systems, as well as dissipating factors. And then we talked about the stages of development, how things start off as an organized cluster of thunderstorms as a tropical disturbance, not yet having a closed circulation center, then progressing to tropical depression with one closed isobar um, and winds less than 33 knots. Tropical storm generally has multiple closed isobars. The system is, is deepening or getting stronger. The pressure is lowering at the center, becoming better organized, eventually into a hurricane or typhoon with very distinct features via satellite imagery such as the eye, the eye wall, uh, as well as rain bands that wrap around these systems. A warm core, don't forget hurricanes are warm core with the warmest temperatures toward the center. Uh, they favor the favorable formation areas. Uh, I don't really have that on here, but in generally you have the Eastern Pacific and the Northern Hemisphere as well as the Atlantic Ocean, North Atlantic, which we're familiar with, all the way out to Africa in the, the main development region. Super hurricanes and typhoons, that is when the winds exceed 130, 130 knots or greater. We classify um, hurricanes and typhoons as super. And then damage and destruction, storm surge is very deadly. If you don't evacuate and you try to hunker down in a location, the water levels can rise rather rapidly, as we saw in Hurricane Katrina along the Gulf Coast. Um, that just wiped out a lot of things, uh, unfortunately, for those folks. That wraps things up on Spot on Weather for the video on tropical weather. I certainly hope you've enjoyed this training. Um, perhaps in the future I'll put together a um, brief, a little training brief that will show, we'll, we'll cover the top 10 most destructive hurricanes for the U.S., something along those lines where we can kind of compare and contrast storms of the past. Um, that wraps things up. I hope everybody has a great day. Take care, everybody. Until next time, Spot on Weather. If we're not spot on, we're not doing right. Great, great day, everybody.